Ah, oh, London. What a town. History around every corner, and a tourist photographing it. Pub serving up a pint and a smile. All that music, theatre and art. And multiculturalism. And the world's oldest underground, the Tube. The class of cities, really. Top shelf stuff. Only took 12,000 years to build it up, and one night to tear it all down. our status. Perimeter security's down, but plenty of your flying friends about. Fucking hell. Dalton, no time to waste. Yes, ma'am. I'm in. Any idea what we're up against, Bailey? If you haven't rushed off, I might. Ever consider leaving these security threats to the authorities? That's rich, Bagley. The government would sooner arrest us for trying to help than actually do something useful. We'll have to sort this one on our own. Carefully, Dalton. Bagley, are you detecting a little worry in Sabine's voice? Brilliant. Asking the computer about feelings. This explains so much. Shut it, you two, and get to work. There she is. That hurt you more than it hurt me. Do us a favor and keep it quiet, Dalton. If they don't shoot me, I won't shoot them. How's that?
We've got loads of dead set gear down here. And why do you suppose that is? What? How did they get their hands on it? I don't know. But someone wants to make it look like DedSec was here. Shit. You need to proceed with extreme caution, Dalton. Who are these men in black, anyway? Nothing identifying. I suspect that's by design. Electrical is live. Oh, fuck me. The entire place is rigged to blow. Jesus, those canisters. Badly as that. RDX nitrogen. Enough to level Parliament. Can you locate a detonator, Bagley? Not exactly, but there's a device streaming a fuckload of encrypted data from the floor above you. Yeah, that fits the bill. On my way. Bagley, is that not the detonator? No, but it's a transmitter sending a signal to a device on the floor above us. Safe to assume that would be the detonator we're looking for. Stage dead sec propaganda all around the bombs. These pricks are gonna blow up Parliament and hang it on us. Not if you get to that detonator first. of Commons. Whoever these men in black are, they've got brass bollocks to set up in the centre of government. Found the detonator. And it's definitely live. Bagley, I'm gonna need some help with this. Yes, you are, but sadly, I'm locked out. Fuck. Well, we don't have a chance without Bagley. Wait, I might know a workaround. We trained your manual overrides at MI5. You're full of surprises. Be quick about it. All right, Bagley, do your thing. I'm in. And the bombs have just armed themselves. Well, that may complicate matters. For fuck's sake. Can you defuse them or not? Of course I can. But I might also trip another failsafe and vaporize you. So, fair warning. I expect this to draw some attention your way, Dalton. Oh, I'm counted on it. Company at our back door. Shit. Dalton, we've got some heat here at HQ. How long is this going to take, Bagley? Depends how often you interrupt me with questions. All right, everyone. Faces on, guns out. It's about to get real. Fuck. They're on me. I'll try and hold them off. Keep your eyes open. Shots fired! Oh, I do this! 
Franklin, tell me you're close. I'm through security, now wading through terabytes of decoy code looking for the detonation sequence. Bagley, update. Let's just say I'm both impressed and annoyed by how sophisticated this anti-tamper security is. Still working. Problem, Dalton. I need your physical appendages now. What's wrong? There are three slots on the left. One of them is the receiver. You need to pull the controller wire. Are you fucking kidding me? No, I'm fucking not. Pull the wire. If this gets me blown up... Diffused. <laughs> See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Bagley, you bastard. You're gonna give me a bloody heart attack then. <laughs> whoa, 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 what the fuck am I looking at? It appears Parliament is not the only target. More bombs are going live as we speak. On screen, Bagley. Fucking hell, we need to get the word out. Those sites need to be evacuated. They're spread out all over London. There isn't any time. But my sister's at the Tone Conference. We have to do something. I picked up a transmitter on the roof that is sending out a signal to the other bomb sites. If you can reach it... I can shut it all down. Sabine! Fuck! Dalton, we're breached! Go! The roof! Sabine, what's going on? We're being raided. It's a bloodbath. The protocol is to wipe everything, including Bagley. I need him for the transmitter. I know, but if they get him, they get everything. Names, opt, locations. Okay, I'll do it the old-fashioned way. Wipe him. Yes, wipe me. Do it, Sabine, and get the hell out of there. Fuck. Okay. Bagley's down. You're on your own. Dalton, if this goes... It won't. I'll see you at the rally point. I promise. Good luck.
for you. Oh, you still think you're here to save London? I'm afraid that's not going to happen. You're here to help us with some important work. Important work? Killing thousands of... Exactly. To save the world. You do know Londoners have died before, hmm? The plague, the Great Fire, the Blitz. There's not much fun. But destruction is always the cure. And it begins today. Zero day. It's time for a hard reset. Oh my god. devastated three sites in London. Authorities are asking residents to remain in their homes as the situation continues to develop. We have received no official casualty total, but it is expected. Mourners gathered for a series of candlelight vigils that brought closure to thousands of families and indeed to an entire city. London is now laser focused. They attend Downing Street, where Nigel Cass, CEO of private military company Albion, received a mandate to secure London. Cass has vowed to hunt down dead set. The terrorist responses failed. Albion used cutting-edge artificial intelligence systems and autonomous drones to capture the remaining members of dead set. A stark warning to would-be insurgents. Operations are posting record profits due to increased efficiencies in production and distribution, enabled by the use of technologies initially developed and approved for security purposes. As crime numbers take a dive, illegal gambling, drug trafficking and prostitution all down following prosecutions of the leaders of four of London's five largest criminal syndicates, the streets of Camden and Brixton. As Albion's mandate is extended indefinitely by the government, life finally begins to return to normal. Curfews and travel restrictions have been lifted in all boroughs thanks to the Reports of rioting in Trafalgar Square have been greatly exaggerated, possibly by foreign meddlers pushing a false narrative through social media. Albion is in complete control of a few reprimand the public about the circulation of fake news, conspiracy theories persisting in dark corners of the internet that terrorist group Dead Set were framed for the bombings have been roundly rejected. Our own reporters could not find a single Londoner willing to expound those theories on camera. The facts simply do not any other story. I need to assemble a team, but I can't reboot DeadSec alone. Let me break into London CTOS and see who's available. I'm Claire Waters, and we've been discussing the hacktivist, now alleged terrorist group, DeadSec, on this week's Buccaneer Radio. I have Colin calling in. Colin, what's your take? Now, I've been saying from the start we should have round up dead sick and thrown them in jail. Now, I say they should all be lined up and shut. You don't find it awfully convenient that they've been fingered as the attackers, but we've seen no proof. Look at town! Look at our city! What more proof do you need? Well, Colin, I'd say you have to look at their history of non-violent action. Albion's put more civilians in the hospital in the past few months than dead sick ever has. I smell a scapegoat. Now I have Emily calling in. Emily, what's your take? You're absolutely right, Claire. The government's just framing DedSec because they want to make it seem like they have this under control. They probably have no clue who was behind the bombings. But that doesn't look good on the news, does it? DedSec's been a thorn in their side. Who better to pin it on? Angie, I have you next. What do you make of all this? I think, if anything, DedSec showed their true colours. 
It's terrifying to think we harbored such a dangerous element for years. Terrorists in our own backyard. Do you find DedSec more frightening than the different gangs in London like Clan Kelly? Clan Kelly might set your shop on fire and maybe they'd kill you, but even they wouldn't try to blow up all of Parliament. Next I have Crypto King. Do you feel safer using a pseudonym? Everyone should. Why make it easier for them to track you? And now we've seen what they're capable of and how far they're willing to go. Hold on. Do you mean the government? Are you suggesting the government was responsible for the bombings? Oh, trust me, Claire. They didn't do it alone. They're all in on it. The government, Albion, Sirs, Bloom, Sky Bloody Larson, and all the way up to Downing Street. They want to keep us scared, harness us with, with mind control, suck every last ounce of usefulness out of us, and, and even in death they'll sell off our bodies. And what do you suggest we do, Crypto King? Go underground. Deep enough, no electric signal can get you. It's the only way. Well, thank you to all of our callers today, and thank you for tuning in and scouting for the truth along with me. Next week, Buccaneer Radio will be diving into the Albion Corporation. Just who are these men and women being paid lucrative amounts for the city's defense? Are they protecting us? Protecting London? Or someone else's interests? See you next week, fellow pirates. Claire Waters, out. is worse than I thought. Ah, uh, but there's a candidate. Looks like you're dead sex best hope.
glad to see you're alive. If you're still committed to the cause, DedSec needs you. I'll send you the coordinates to our last safe house. Meet me there. Fine. downloaded a patch to your optics so you can access our security system. It's set up so that I can't just let someone who isn't dead sec in. You'll have to do the manual override. I'm not thrilled about getting my hands dirty, but I suppose one does what one must. Hey, 
equipment. I'll see you downstairs later then. You look like an asshole. A stupid man. In for a penny. Hello and welcome. Ah, a dank pitch black cellar. Just what I was hoping for. Coming up in today's episode of The Upload, we're talking about how Bagley managed to conquer London. Pretty much my favourite topic, I could talk for hours about the rise of the AI system. It's easy to forget about its origins, it's so present everywhere we go now. Bagley just kind of blends into the background. Bagley is the service AI that's present in every optic device. Whether you're using the optic, Bagley will be there. The AI is streamed to your optic from Bloom Central Command Centre and it was first created by Skylass and our tech hero as part of her techno-utopian idea for the world. Why do you think it grew so quickly? In my mind, it's no surprise that Bagley became so popular. It's funny, useful, fast. It's a great companion and really just makes life so much easier. I mean, when you look back at all the service AIs that used to exist, they just can't compete. When you ask Bagley anything, there's a quick answer and loads of information available to you. One day, I let Bagley answer all of my messages for a whole 24 hours and no one even noticed the difference. The other competitors really just couldn't compete with Bagley. Their answers were so much worse, they didn't understand anything, and Bagley pretty much gets everything right first time. Do you have any idea why Bagley really beat all the competition? Well, it's really the data, isn't it? Ever since Broker hooked up with Bloom, that's when things changed. And really, that's not actually that great. Bloom has data on everybody. They collect information about everything you're doing across the web through your optic headset. Isn't the AI only good because of Bloom surveillance? Well, I suppose so, but I'd prefer not to talk about that side of things. Bagley is so special because it's been trained on this huge cache of information. That's how these AI systems work, or at least used to work. I mean, we don't really know that much about the latest version because there's so much secrecy around the tech. But they're given this huge amount of training data. It's basically a huge database that's used to teach the AI about patterns in behavior. You know, so if you always travel the same way to your house, it can predict when you're going to go and get a self-driving car ready for you before you even ask for it. That's pretty terrifying. In some ways, I don't want this data to, sort of, to drive my life. It understands too much at times. Have you heard some of the rumors around the hacked version of Bagley? I've heard mutterings, yes. I've heard it's been used by DedSec. I wouldn't put it past them. It's pretty well known that they're not fans of Bloom. But the idea of a souped up version of Bagley, given it's already so intelligent, is a bit terrifying. I wonder what they could actually make it do. I'm Claire Waters, and we've been discussing the hacktivist, now alleged terrorist group, DedSec, on this week.
That is interesting. Coming up today on The Upload, we're talking about Sky Larson, the enigmatic founder of Broker Tech. Everyone knows her name, but no one knows too much about her. And we only really see her these days as a hologram. She was pretty young when she launched Broker Tech, the company that is best known for introducing Bagley to the world. Nowadays, it's hard to remember a world before Bagley. And I think that what Sky Larson's done with Bagley is absolutely incredible. Bagley is the most advanced, significant AI of our time, and it's really blown all the other AIs that were created out of the water. Yeah, I mean, I can't really imagine the optic without it. But what do you know about Sky Larson herself? Um, not a lot other than that she's actually pretty incredible. I've followed her work for a long time, and she's always been a pretty private person. I know that she supposedly grew up in the countryside, but there isn't actually that much more we know about her other than this tech that she's put out into the world. I've always found it a bit creepy that she's so obsessed with this idea of transhumanism. Why wouldn't you be when you've got a mind as amazing as Skye's? Why wouldn't you want to take what you've got and actually augment it by working with technology, by improving your physical self, changing your body and the world around you, implementing more technology to extend your life and really sort of extend human capabilities. You sound pretty much in love with Sky Larson, I have to say. I can't comment on that, but I am a big fan of her work. She's been one of these people that has transformed the world around us, and just watching how her mind works from afar is pretty incredible, because some of what the technology she's introduced has changed how we all live our lives, and Bagley has been this really incredible assistance to humanity as a whole. Did I ever tell you that I actually interviewed Sky Larson once? Really? I thought she never spoke to the media or anything. So this was a long time ago, back in the day when she was a little bit more accessible and she was one of these people that just had an amazing presence. You were inspired by her very being and she was just incredibly talented and knowledgeable and one of possibly the best living people that I've ever met. I'm not sure you're being too objective there. I mean, I imagine she's not very likable as a person. She obviously despises humanity in some way. I think she believes that becoming data is preferable to being human. She's one of these people who is extremely methodical in everything that she does, and she does everything to perfection and really tries to change the world around her and make it a better place for us to live in. If you say so. This is London Calling. You're here with me, Tash, on Buccaneer, your source for what they don't want you to know. In today's world, we've all had to get used to our every move being tracked by the optic on our temples, by the cameras around us, and with every click we make online. Seems like everything we do feeds the big data beast. Why are data giants like Bloom so hungry to get hold of our private information and our metadata? What are they using it for? Will we ever have real private lives again? What is privacy in the digital world? And what happens when capitalism and surveillance become one? As you know, we keep all names confidential on Buccaneer. Speaking from a secure location, here's new technology strategist Charles, who worked all over the world trying to keep democracy strong in the face of the data assault. If you have enough personal data on somebody, you're able to predict what it is that they're going to do. You can tell what they might be passionate about, but mostly you can tell what they fear. And if you can tell what someone fears, then you can manipulate them and you can move them in particular directions. Like, data is collected on citizens in 
every possible way. Data is collected through surveillance cameras. Data is collected from television sets. Data is collected from voter records. It's collected from how much power do you use in your house and how much water do you use in your house. In pre-crisis Britain, we got really used to all of our services being free. Everything suddenly became free that was digital. But what people forgot is that if you're not paying for it, then you're the product being sold. If technology brings out the worst in capitalism, capitalism brings out the worst in technology. Senior academic Alfie tells us how big business repurposes big data. Historically, what's happened, of course, is that people have traded their, their privacy for their convenience as, as smartphones and other kinds of technology came in and became mass-consumed, mass-used items and technological objects. Gradually, people were so attracted to the, the affordances of these technologies that privacy kind of retreated into the background and into a state we've got now where it's essentially gone. Having this access to this data makes huge tech companies like Bloom so much more powerful than, than they would be otherwise and not just in the obvious ways. Of course, there's a lot of uh, worry and, and fear over what they can do with the data, they can track anyone, find anyone, see what every individual is doing at any point in time. But I think there's even deeper reasons why this data empowers these huge companies to control our society and, and make us do things. So lots of predictive technologies which are implemented by these tech giants, it's not only interested in knowing what we're going to do, but influencing the patterns of our movement. So technologies might suggest routes to use in the city, places to go, restaurants to go to, cafes to go to, music to listen to. And these suggestions are not just predicting what we might like to do, they're actually influencing the way citizens move, think, eat, meet, and, and use their city as a space. So London has become a place where a small group of, of, of surveillance capitalist companies like Bloom can control the movements of individuals and, and orchestrate the way they, they move around their city and the way they essentially live, the things they do, the things they, they they enjoy and, and the life they lead. So we're really kind of outsourcing our decision making, I would say, to, to a huge corporate capitalist company. And there's something very, very scary about that indeed. All these technologies can be used to, to not only influence us to act as the perfect consumer, but also to prevent us from doing radical and revolutionary things. So technologies in, 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 in foreign nations have, that have been used are things like um, heat map features which show where populations are gathering, uh, in-game rewards can be offered to people to take different routes, things like that. Um, traffic data can be manipulated to prevent people gathering and, and protesting, as has happened in, in some of the authoritarian regimes across the world recently. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is not only um, a set of technologies which make people behave as, as ideal consumers, but ones which actually can be put to use to prevent radical and, and disruptive behaviour in the city, which, which limits the, the power of any kind of revolutionary force. So if you thought you had a private life, get used to it. You don't. And we're not going to reclaim our lives without a fight. I'm Tash, and you've been listening to Buccaneer, keeping the resistance informed. Keep listening, keep fighting, and remember, nobody owns you but you. is London Calling. You're listening to Buccaneer, your pirate podcast source for what they don't want you to know. I'm Tash, and this time we're giving a special shout out from us to the boys and girls at the Signal and Intelligence Response Service, better known as SIRS. Why not? 
they're going to be listening anyway. They're listening to everything. They probably know that you're listening to this show right now. But don't worry, we're not going to say anything bad about a massive, unaccountable spy organisation that uses its powers to stifle dissent and shut down free speech. Instead, we're going to look at how SIRS became so powerful. And as usual, we'll keep everyone's names and locations secret so SIRS doesn't come looking for them. Charles is an expert in the dark arts of surveillance who worked to set up democratic media in post-communist states. How did it go so wrong in Britain? You know, we're looking at all the wrong things when we look at Britain's crisis. There's a lot of uh, concentration on data and how that's been used and, and manipulated. And what we haven't looked at is the power structures and the profit that lies behind this. For example, if we examine what actually happened, you know, there's a, there's a company that's really very interested in uh, selling passports and making it easy to uh, provide visas for investment and so on. And historically, throughout the world they've been working with this big data manipulation company in order to overthrow governments and then suddenly all the chickens came home to roost nobody could find any receipts for what was paid for nobody could figure out how things were done but everybody had a feeling that something really stunk and they couldn't figure it out and yet it was standing there in their face the whole time there's a couple of different ways that we got where it is that we are. I mean, one, you have a lot of uh, smaller organizations, smaller power groups, uh, companies as well, um, who are bending things just a little, oh, we'll compromise a little bit, we'll bend the rules a little bit, um, and try to achieve what it is that we hope to achieve that's good for us. And, and if you add all of that up, what you end up with is a big wall moving in a big way um, from a lot of little buttons being pushed but also there's this other thing that's going on here is the gathering of data and the analysis of data has authoritarianism contained within its DNA um, it is by its nature a tool for authoritarianism uh, and it has been used in that way how does big data look into our lives James covered it for the pre-crisis press <laughs> We're starting to see the merger of private data and that with data held by the state into what are called social credit systems. This is where every aspect of your behaviour is monitored and totted up by a central system to sort of score you as a person, a bit like a credit card but predicated on all of your behaviour rather than just uh, the money you're spending. And this can have profound impact. We're starting to see systems emerge which will punish you and stop you from doing things in society based on your behaviours and this can be as trivial as if you jaywalk, if you cross the road in the wrong place, you might lose points if you uh, do some community activities uh, or help your neighbours, you might earn points and, and then this can be used to sort of evaluate you as a person and this could mean for example better travel privileges, being able to travel first class or being denied from travelling first class to not being allowed to travel at all uh, these systems are very real and very possible because of all of the data that is now held on us Ian was a veteran political writer and podcaster back in the days of pre-crisis Britain. Is the world we're living in now fascist? Well, this is what fascism is. It is the complete and total control of the individual. The desire to basically say to the individual, nothing in your life matters. On an individual basis, you are now part of the whole part of the nation and the only meaning that you will find in your life is to become part of the nation what is the nation the nation doesn't mean anything right the nation is basically just encapsulated by the leader that takes over that claims that he you know has this sort of access to the soul of the country to the soul of the people he never does it's just a myth but that's what they go for and on that basis they take the right to control every aspect of your life from who you talk to to where you eat to where you go to hang out with your friends I mean, what we're seeing now is a contemporary iteration of this process where you get corporations and the state operating in tandem, basically moulded into one another. But that isn't that rare. I mean, you saw exactly the same thing in Nazi Germany. You look at the concentration camps that operated in Nazi Germany, there were private companies in those camps making use of that slave labour. Fascism often works with corporations, and it's doing the same now. That's the way in which they track what you do. That's the way in which they track who you talk to. They operate as each other's proxies. So if your ears are burning and you think someone might be watching you, you're probably right. They're watching all of us. 
I'm Tash, and you've been listening to Buccaneer. Keep listening, keep sharing the show, and keep it encrypted. They're watching us, but we're watching them too. Registration detected. Identify yourself or I'll seal the exits, hack your optic, and read you every drunken email you ever wrote until you starve. I'm with Sabine. Who the hell are you and why do you sound like a mobile phone? Sabine's alive? Well, that's one piece of good news. I'm Bagley, DedSec's definitely not stolen, highly advanced AI assistant, and it seems I've been out of commission for a few months. Anyway, why don't you go connect me to the DedSec network so I can become more powerful than you could possibly imagine? I mean, catch up on what I missed. to the upload. In this episode, we're talking about CTOS 3.0, the city operating system that's now powering all of London. For those of you who need reminding, as if anyone does at this point, CTOS was first used in Chicago in 2014 and then at San Francisco in 2017 before coming here to London. And every time it's been rolled out, it's been pretty much an unmitigated disaster. For those of you who are listening who are lucky enough not to be here in London's chaotic scenes, it's worth remembering that the Telecoms Tower is now owned by Bloom. The tower looms over northwest London. It's always been a communications hub, acting as part of the UK's television and communications network, although there's been some secrecy around its use. And now that Bloom owns it, it's only even more secret. Yeah, now everything that's part of Bloom's city surveillance operation is run through the Telecoms Tower. And I have to say, it looks completely ridiculous. It's got that silly... Hello and welcome back to The Upload. In this episode, we're talking about CTOS 3.0, the city operating system that's now powering all of London. For those of you who need reminding, as if anyone does at this point, CTOS was first used in Chicago in 2014 and then at San Francisco in 2017 before coming here to London. And every time it's been rolled out, it's been pretty much an unmitigated disaster. For those of you who are listening who are lucky enough not to be here in London's chaotic scenes, it's worth remembering that the Telecoms Tower is now owned by Bloom. The tower looms over northwest London. It's always been a communications hub, acting as part of the UK's television and communications network, although there's been some secrecy around its use. And now that Bloom owns it, it's only even more secret. Yeah, now everything that's part of Bloom's city surveillance operation is run through the Telecoms Tower. And I have to say, it looks completely ridiculous. It's got that silly crown thing at the top and all the blue light. What's that even about? What does it do? I don't see that there's any purpose to that at all. It's a blight on the skyline, if you ask me. And it's become the main point of control for millions of people. The system network and Bagley are both operated and streamed from there too. And don't forget about the self-driving cars too. I always thought they were just running on their own. No, CTOS is the big control system behind the cars. There was a point back in the earliest days of self-driving car technology that they operated by themselves. They used to use a series of sensors to see the world around them. Radar, for instance, would look far off into the distance, while LiDAR would detect objects nearby. And while these cars still use uh, some of this technology, Bloom CTOS and its detailed maps and data that it has on London really makes Bloom be able to take control of it. And CTOS can take control of your car if you're parked incorrectly. It's no surprise that it was made mandatory to have a self-driving car. The system is so bad though, it's so annoying. Whenever I try to use one of the shareable self-driving cars, I always find myself stuck in traffic jams or roadblocks. Not to mention the accidents, I've heard so many stories of cars shunting into the back of others. 
I think they're worse than human drivers sometimes. The technology was meant to make things better, but Bloom has made it so bad that it just makes London even more chaotic than it was before. I'm giving up on the cars. I'm only using the bikes, which are not self-driving at the moment, at least. And don't even get me started on the data. Everything that Bloom sees from your movements around the city and the self-driving cars is collected and feeds back into its big information control system. Oh, not you and Bloom and privacy again. You're a broken record. Not as broken as our city's cars. it i'm reconnected to the network downloading our database news archives and oh 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 no terrorist group deadsec responsible for deadly bombings in london dalton wolf dead i leave you people alone for a second and you immediately cock it all up so bagley if not deadsec then who was behind the bombings there's a gap in my memory after dalton well let's be honest after i disarmed the bomb at parliament i'm missing information about what happened after i was taken offline but from what I can infer, an unknown hacker group identified only as Zero Day was involved. I believe this Zero Day staged the attacks and framed DeadSec for their dirty work. Come to my terminal. Sabine is requesting a video call. Patching in Sabine Brandt now. I suggest you listen very closely to anything she has to say. There you are. I'm glad you made it. Backley. God, it's good to hear your demented little voice. Is your memory intact? Not even slightly. The last record I have is of our HQ being raided. My only lead is a group known as Zero Day. Ring any bells? No. But the HQ was attacked by some men in black. The same that were at Parliament. Maybe working together. We didn't stand a chance. They just gunned everyone down. My god. How'd you survive? I managed to escape through the sewers to Camden. A contact smuggled me out of the city and I've been hiding out in the north since. Prudent. Your profile is red flagged as a high priority target in the city's surveillance system. Even a partial recognition here would have you hunted down and shot on sight. There aren't many dead sec fans in London these days. Look, I want to help, I do. But joining up with you now verges on suicidal. Listen, if anyone knows anything about risks, it's me. I lost everything and everyone. But it comes down to this. London is in a death spiral. And if DeadSec can't pull it out, trust me, no one can. The city needs a resistance. And it starts with you. What do you say? Fine. But you owe me. Excellent! New user registered! Welcome to DeadSec! Now, it would be irresponsible of us to release you naked and mewling into the wild. You'll find equipment around the safe house that are essential items in your DeadSec kit.
we have a sophisticated system for hiding your identity from facial recognition tech. It's called a mask. And while we're here, perhaps we can talk about updating your wardrobe. I mean, look at you. Come on. You've got all these fancy new toys, but it's also important to know the basics. You need to learn how to throw a punch and how to take one. Albion will escalate if you come at them with a gun and shoot you down. We want to avoid collateral damage. In DedSec, we try to use guns only as a last resort. Have you already met Connie Robinson? She owns the pub and is an old DedSec contact, not to mention a champion amateur boxer. Go to the practice ring and she'll show you how to stop flinching when someone cocks a punch at you.
This is the bug. Hello, resistors. It's bug time. Are you all sitting comfortably? No? Good. That's as it should be. This is the bug. I'm Andy, and joining me to analyse the latest blowflies to emerge from the corpse of a once free Britain, it's Alice. Hello, Andy. And today, we're going to talk to you about Albion, uh, your friends and mine. Alice, the government has extended Albion's contract and have also boasted that violent crime has plummeted to a record low. Now, extending Albion's contract, to me, that's like having a pet dog, let's call it Nigel for the sake of argument, that attacks you every single day and thinking to yourself, wouldn't it be nice if Nigel had puppies? <laughs> that contract has been extended so many times, it's like the neck of a politician that's criticised the government. <laughs> I'm not sure entirely how those contract extension negotiations went, probably, like, like, like a footballer. In the old days, I assume Albion's agent was leaking stories to the press about how our favourite private militia was being tapped up by Barcelona or by <laughs> Munich. The government panics and thinks, well, we better get them signed up before it's too late. But still, violent crime, a record low, although I imagine that probably depends exactly how you count it. If you include violent crime committed by the state, either themselves or via Albion, their chosen violent crime contractors, who provide such a very valuable bargain service of beating people up, well, it's probably not quite as low as the figures suggest. I don't know. I, I think they're probably right. Who has the opportunity to commit violent crime these days anyway? The moment you pick up a fruit knife, you get tasered by a robot policeman and deported for looking Bulgarian. <laughs> it's a much more peaceful society. It's just much less of a society. I want to know the details of the contracts, Alice. I mean, are they paid per dissident duffed up? Is it, is it a set rate for each extrajudicial state mugging? And what is that rate? What do you think? Well, they certainly look like they're trying to hit a quota of some kind. <laughs> well, what, is the, what is the set rate? Is it what, 99 .95? cryptos bargain. It seems very reasonable indeed. <laughs> I, I imagine they don't ask too much anyway, because it's just so nice to get paid for doing your hobby anyway, isn't it? I imagine it doesn't even feel like work. <laughs> I mean, who needs violent crime anymore anyway? You know, you can just starve to death without even starting a gang war. We do have to ask exactly what does the Prime Minister make of all this. Uh, let's ask him. <phone rings> oh, I, I hope they pick up. Hello, you're through to number 10 Downing Street. Hello, is the Prime Minister there, please? <laughs> Let me just check. Sorry, you've missed him. I'm afraid he's popped out for the decade. Oh, never mind. Is there anyone else I can talk to? Yes, of course. There's a shady cabal of vested interests who control him and prop him up in power. Great, I'll have a chat with them then. Oh, Andy, remember when you'd get away with prank calls without people coming round to your house to beat the shit out of you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, happy time. You're listening to the bar. Did you think the Prime Minister will, will, will ever come back? I don't think we've ever had a Prime Minister. Well, that's a much more reassuring way of looking at things. <laughs> what have we become, Alice? When you look at the state of our politics, we're supposed to have the mother of parliaments. Well, this is one mother that has emphatically abandoned her kids in the woods to be brought up by wolves. And let me tell you, that never works out like it does in the stories. Wolves are bad parents, <laughs> unless you're a wolf, in which case they can do a job bringing you up as a wolf. Do not give your children to wolves. And do we actually own anything as a country now? Is there anything we haven't flogged off for profit? Oh, I think we've basically just become a homeopathic Britain. Yeah. Diluted and diluted until there's barely a trace of the original Britain left. But some quackish lunatics insist it actually works better that way. It's total bullshit. Is there anything left? New on the bug this week, a new feature. The bug off feature. Uh, the person who has most irritated us uh, in Britain uh, this week, we're going to tell to bug off and to get things going. I'm going to nominate uh, Big Nigel. Nigel Cass, look, this is Britain. Uh, history tells us this place is a bastion of freedom. I'm just not sure that that kind of freedom should involve Big Nigel expressing his freedom to run a private army. I guess. Historically, there is a precedent, the East India Company. That was a trading house with an army of 250,000 soldiers, which is a lot for a company. The Bug PLC has Alice with a water pistol. But crucially, <laughs> compared with Albion, the East India Company didn't operate its quarter of a million strong army in London. Uh, it did it a long way away, <laughs> out of sight. Out of mind. Anyone to nominate for, for the bug off, Alex? I think today's bug off for me goes to my streaming service. I'm sick of being recommended things based on things I already like. The other day it recommended me to watch a reality TV competitive dating show set in a nude commune. Andy, I watched it and I liked it. And I do not want to be the kind of person who enjoys nude competitive reality television dating shows. <laughs> I did not want to know that about myself. I have to go sit in the corner and cry. That's it from the bug. Don't forget the live show that is so secretive it is definitely not happening at the usual time and place this month. Definitely not. And definitely do not not tell anyone not not to come to it. It's definitely not happening. <laughs> usual time and place. Bye-bye.
to get so worked up over something this minor. I'll be right down. Could use the warm up. Let's start with some basic strikes. Hit me. Don't be shy. Yes. Nice one. You want to get in under my block. Find the weak point. You're getting it. Just like that. On your feet now. You want to create distance. Yes, nice one. Gear in order? Know enough not to punch yourself in the face or get shot for pulling out a gun too early? Brilliant. I'm working out how we find Zero Day and ruin their day, but I need someone with actual legs to do the legwork. Hope you're ready. We have some damage control to do if we want to change the perception that we're a bunch of violent thugs. I'll let you be the judge of how best to handle yourself, but remember, you represent DedSec now. All right, Sabine, what's our plan? Make no mistake, London is under occupation. Armed mercenaries patrol our streets, allegedly to keep people safe, but really they're keeping the people scared. And all our cowering just makes us easier to step on. Albion needs this terror. It's how they consolidate their power. So we have to ignite the will to resist in the people of London by showing them that Albion aren't the solution. They're the problem. For that, we'll need information. I'm pushing two sets of coordinates to your optic. Cheers, Bagley. I've identified two opportunities. One, we're going to disrupt some Albion propaganda. Remind the people it's not Albion's way or the highway. Two, we need intel about Albion operations if we want to throw a spanner in their plans. You game? How could I say no to you? Brilliant. Let's get the people of London on board.
Getting arsehole and throwing bits of metal around has got to count as training somehow. Yes! How would you like that then? Rubbish. There's no need. Fine. Don't listen to me. It's your hide. 